Enlightenment thinkers so far. And the three we've already dealt with, uh, Mr. Locke, Montesquieu, and Voltaire, are kind of the first generation uh, uh, philosophs. And I've left some of them out. There wasn't only three, but those are the three big names. The rest of the folks on our list here came a generation or more later, uh, and so their thought uh, certainly was built uh, on top of and influenced by the three that we just we just talked about. We now get to David Hume, a uh, brilliant Scottish thinker, uh, uh, like Locke, an empiricist. I mean, he believed that knowledge came through the senses, uh, and also a skeptic uh, of Enlightenment thought in some ways, and just a skeptic, period. A skeptic is someone who uh, uh, believes it's not easy to sort of prove uh, that things are true. Uh, uh, and skepticism is of great value in uh, thought science. Uh, it's always useful to have somebody who's sort of doubting, uh, not to be negative and pessimistic, but to kind of uh, get folks to redouble their efforts or their own efforts uh, to think things through clearly. And let's think it through again. Let's think it through again. Uh, I think there's some holes and weaknesses logically uh, here or there. Uh, empiricists uh, aren't always skeptics, and they don't seem to go together necessarily, because an empiricist is saying we acquire knowledge uh, through the senses, uh, and a skeptic is sort of question is questioning whether you know whether and how much we can acquire knowledge at all. Uh, so in that sense, they seem to be opposites, but. I think the easiest way to think of this for our purposes is to think to say Hume believed the only way to have anything uh, uh, close to an understanding of the world is by you know empirical knowledge, evidence that we gather through sight and sound and you know experiments and observation. Right? I mean, sight, uh, right, is one of the senses. You're looking through a telescope uh, at the planets uh, and observing them. Uh, uh, writing it down, you're looking at your calculations. So sight is a big part of this, uh, and that's how we acquire knowledge. Uh, but he's saying that there's so much to be skeptical of in terms of what human beings can know. The only thing uh, that uh, keeps us safe uh, and on the right track, uh, you know, at all, uh, is commitment to empirical knowledge. That kind of experiment, observation, oriented, uh, kind of uh, Francis Bacon type inductive reasoning. Uh, but it's also, you know, continuously helpful to be skeptical. So an empiricist uh, like John Locke, um, but uh, more consistent, I think, in his empiricism than Locke. I mentioned Locke's political philosophy, at least in passing, can be seen as not quite very empirical, but so can the blank slate that we talked about. Uh, and I kind of forgot to say that, so I'm going to say it here quickly. Uh, but the, what what is it about observation? How do you observe through you know, the senses that the mind is a blank slate at birth? I mean, in the 18th century, anyway, when you don't have instruments that can, you know, peek inside somebody's body or head, uh, and uh, uh, there's no sub subject of neuroscience. And how how, how did he know that empirically? Uh, and yet. The blank slate idea uh, does take off in the Enlightenment, which I think bears our scrutiny. I'm going to take this off because I'm not talking about David Hume at the moment. But the blank slate idea was incredibly popular with uh, Enlightenment thinkers. And we need to, I think, get a grip on why, because some of it's going to come up indirectly as we go on here. Locke's idea uh, is remarkably uh, 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 exciting to the philosophers. Because if the idea is to use enlightenment thinking to reform the world, change it for the better, to make progress, uh, uh, what could be more exciting than thinking that when human beings are born, they're kind of these empty vessels, uh, so that through education, all we have to do is fill up these young minds with enlightenment stuff, uh, and uh, uh, they'll, you know, sort of when they get become of age, they'll, they, they will not be able to wait to implement Enlightenment ideas into policy. So if we educate the whole society in Enlightenment ideas, we're filling up these blank slate, you know, brains, heads, uh, with only enlightened ideas and knowledge. Perfect. Uh, if only it were true. Uh, but of course, it's uh, it turned out uh, not to be true that the mind is a is a blank slate. Although uh, uh, it's still fairly popular, I think, to believe that it's true. Uh, although 
in, in the social sciences and humanities, although science has seemed to disprove it, there's not always a total connection between uh, science on one side and the social sciences and the humanities on the other side. That's a good example of it, maybe the best. So back to Hume. Uh, one of his most famous writings is his essay on miracles. Uh, and uh, uh, he, uh, I, I like to use this as an example of typical Enlightenment reasoning, Enlightenment thinking. Uh, so uh, Hume admits up front that we can't really prove or disprove miracle stories in the Bible. He's, talk, he's taking miracle stories, you know, famous ones in the Bible, like Moses parting the Red Sea, uh, and says uh, that, okay, so we can't prove or disprove, but what we can do is assign probability. And probability is a big sort of thing uh, in, in the Enlightenment. Uh, because you might not be able to prove something, but you can sort of make a case that something is more likely than something else. So probabilities. Uh, and probability is a very useful uh, device mechanism uh, to this day. Uh, so since you can't be certain, uh, you'd better use empirical observation and then assign uh, probability. Uh, what's the likelihood of this or that? Which uh, you know requires you to estimate. You're not you know you can't be certain uh, of the probability uh, on these types of issues. So uh, what does he do with regard to miracles? Well, he says, okay. So if Moses parted the Red Sea, uh, for that to have actually happened, uh, uh, what would have to be true? Uh, well, uh, what he's getting at is that. If the Red Sea actually did part, meaning all that sort of huge body of water sort of separated and allowed the Hebrews led by Moses to walk across and then close uh, back on the their pursuers in the Egyptians, a, a number of, maybe many, laws of, of nature would have to be temporarily suspended because uh, water just doesn't separate like that in such mass quantities that quickly and in that way. It doesn't work that way. Uh, it happened all in a flash. So he's saying, uh, okay, what are the, what's the probability that that happened? Uh, well, how can we know? Well, how many of us have ever seen that happen, uh, something like that? How many of us have ever known anyone who's seen something like that happen? How many of us have ever written or, or read something other than the Bible uh, that claims something like that happened? Uh, and the answer is supposed to be, and usually is, never. I says, okay, then what other explanation can there be for uh, how this story about Moses parting the Red Sea got into the Bible? Well, maybe uh, somebody exaggerated uh, for uh, you know, certain uh, purposes, um, for religious purposes, maybe uh, to make this uh, religion or that religion sound uh, be more dramatic and more appealing. Uh, maybe they misunderstood or misheard uh, or made a series of errors. Maybe it was passed along uh, the story through a number of generations and it kind of like the classic fish story. I caught a fish this big and as you tell the story it gets bigger and more impressive over time. Uh, how many of us have seen things like that happen? Uh, right? And so in this case, uh, well, yeah, I've people have exaggerated things. I've known people that have or read uh, things that have and uh, who have gotten it wrong or it changed over time. Okay, so then which one of those is the more likely explanation for how these uh, this miracle story and that showed up in the Bible? that it actually happened in history or that uh, somebody misunderstood or, you know, um, you know, changed the story in some way, embellished it. Uh, and so he says the, the weight of the scales weighs much more heavily on the side of somebody, uh, you know, sort of misunderstood it, uh, uh, you know, deliberately or accidentally. Uh, uh, and then th that these kind of things actually happened because nobody's ever seen a law of nature broken that I know of. So, but he does make it clear, I can't, I can't prove or disprove uh, that miracles actually happen in the Bible. So we can do the next best thing and say it probably happened this way and not that way. And that, that that's the best we can do. Uh, but uh, there's th that probability is not certainty. So it means it could, it could be wrong. It's just the, uh, uh, it's more likely to be this and that. It's a typical enlightenment way, enlightenment way to approach something. Uh, Hume is also famous for the fact-value distinction, uh, basically saying that you cannot derive, derive an ought from an is, uh, meaning that facts do not tell you uh, in any way uh, what you ought to do with them. Uh, uh, facts don't tell you, really it's sort of a way of separating fact from uh, morality, uh, saying that fa facts, you know, so scientific facts, 
knowledge acquired doesn't tell you whether it's right or wrong uh, to do this or that with it. Uh, so uh, an important, uh, I think, uh, distinction. To Hume, reading from my own uh, uh, writing here from a book. Uh, uh, oh, this is, uh, again, Hume himself. Uh, so to Hume, the main use of history is, quote, only to discover the constant and universal principles of human nature by showing men in all varieties of circumstances and situations and furnishing us with materials from which we may form our observations and become acquainted with the regular springs of human action and behavior. These records of wars, intrigues, factions, and revolutions are so many collections of experiments uh, by which the politician or moral philosopher fixes the principles of his science as the same uh, as the same manner as the physician or natural philosopher, which means uh, kind of like biologist, becomes acquainted with the nature of plants, mineral, uh, and, other, and other external objects by the experiments which he forms concerning them. So uh, Hume is saying the purpose of history, the, its usefulness, or at least its main uh, purpose, uh, is that it offers us something kind of like already finished, already done laboratory experiments uh, about human nature, uh, which I kind of, I, I already said that earlier, this is a fairly common idea in the Enlightenment, but maybe he's most famous for putting it forward. Uh, but it also shows that uh, something else I said, part of our list of values, uh, when we talked about the overall values of the Enlightenment, that uh, th they really, the philosophers really felt we needed to understand the basics of human nature. What is it that all human beings have and share in common? And they did believe, and he especially, uh, believed that human nature was more or less fixed. Uh, there weren't many different natures. There was one human nature. And I'll repeat this again. It bears repeating. He wasn't saying that there aren't any differences between individuals. That would be silly. Uh, and this is a very, very uh, bright uh, person. Uh, he's just saying that there are similarities and we need to focus on those uh, he and the philosophers believed more than the, than the differences. We'll meet a group of thinkers that comes after these guys, partly in response to them, in opposition to them, that, uh, that takes the opposite track. No, uh, uh, we don't. Uh, it's more important to sort of single out the individual and talk about what's unique about in the imagination and emotions of each individual uh, and not look at what human beings have in common generally. Uh, but that, that's kind of uh, you know, in response and reaction to the Enlightenment. Whew, now we get to this guy, and what a peach he is, or was, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, uh, the anti-philosoph, philosoph. Rousseau uh, was an odd person, uh, to be sure, uh, and uh, uh, his writing uh, it can be difficult uh, to read, uh, um, just the, the syntax and the way of writing, uh, the ideas uh, can be difficult uh, because they're very complex, but also because uh, he seemed to be kind of two different people sometimes. Uh, sometimes he wrote, uh, maybe earlier in his career, so some of this is getting older, uh, where he was sort of more in sympathy with, uh, sort of uh, had that sameness uh, or similarity uh, of thought, kinship of thinking with the other philosophers. He was friends with them, was part of Dolbach's salon for a while. Uh, but uh, in many of his writings, again, usually the ones that came later and often after he quit or was kind of kicked out uh, of the group, uh, he became uh, in many ways an anti-Enlightenment thinker. Uh, and for that reason, we'll see him again when we deal with uh, uh, romantics and the, uh, and the rise of romanticism. He's sometimes seen as the father of romanticism, which counters the Enlightenment and is against it. Uh, so it's like, wait a minute, Rousseau's part of the Enlightenment and he's part of the counter-Enlightenment? Yes. Uh, so it might show a certain uh, uh, you know, split personality here, but I think what it really shows is, the, again, the complexity uh, and genius in his thought. Uh, there are quite a few, unless you can't really quantify this, uh, but uh, there are quite a few scholars that think that Rousseau uh, was the single most uh, you know, just raw uh, talent of the Enlightenment in terms of, again, just sheer genius and, and brain power. Uh, but there's no doubt he was a difficult guy to deal with and get along with, uh, and uh, uh, you know w w was was strange. That's partly what got him mainly what getting got him kicked out of the uh, Dolbach's uh, famous salon. Uh, it wasn't they disagree with his ideas so much, though they eventually did. Uh, it was his behavior. Rousseau was kind of a paranoid type. Uh, one of my professors when I was in college uh, said of Rousseau to make the point that Rousseau's the kind of guy that 
if he came into a crowded room and everyone stopped talking when he walked in, he assumed, not saying it, but he assumed everyone must have been talking about me or they would have kept talking. But if he came into the same room and instead of stopping talking, uh, they just kept going on and talking, uh, he would think they're, ignor they're ignoring me. <laughs> so uh, this is a guy that would sort of think that there was some sort of conspiracy against him no matter what. He'd find a way to, to think uh, that some something was being done against him. So uh, uh, he was a strange individual. He, he People showed him hospitality all the time. In some ways, uh, uh, he was a famous intellectual writer, uh, kind of homeless, that would be taken in by people that respected him because he was a celebrity like Voltaire, uh, famous, uh, and let him live there sometimes for weeks or months. And I mean, and always sort of a spirit of total generosity. And they wouldn't usually ask him to pay rent or anything. And he'd find a way to actually take their hospitality and turn it into an argument against them again and again and again. Uh, basically, you know, complaining about this and that. And like, wait a minute, I've let you stay here for you know three months for free. Uh, uh, you know, brought you meals, done this, and you're now complaining about this. And yes, uh, and he'd be convinced that you were out to get him, uh, even though you 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 just laid everything you know out for him uh, uh, to help to help him uh, to be considerate because you respected him because you liked his writing. Uh, you, know, you, you thought he deserved it but you learned otherwise. Uh, an extremely difficult person to get along with, and almost all the philosophers uh, came to believe that. Uh, David Hume, who we just met, uh, visited the salon on a number of occasions at Dolbox a place when he was working for the British government at the consulate or the uh, embassy in, fr uh, in France. So he was in Paris. Uh, he, he dropped by. And one of the times he was there, Rousseau was looking for a place to live because he'd Again, gotten in an argument with whoever the latest one was. Uh, his fault, as usual. Uh, and Hume, who respected him and knew who he was, and we just met him for the first time, uh, you know, he's famous, uh, said in a conversation with him, invited him to come back to England, and he'd help, he'd put him up. He had a couple of residences, and he could sort of stay in this place, whatever. And when the other members of the salon, Diderot and Dolbach, the host, uh, the owner of the, you know, the, the place, uh, heard about it, they, they took Hume aside and, I mean, that, to talk to him again, and you can't do this. You will be totally sorry that you asked this guy to stay. It, it won't turn out well, I will guarantee you. And they told him all the stories and this and that, but Hume was this kind of very nice, uh, gregarious guy, uh, good-natured guy, nice guy, and so, and, ah, he's gonna be fine. Uh, and sure enough, uh, he turned on uh, Hume, uh, and uh, uh, it got it got nasty. They were already kind of tabloids in those days, you know, kind of gossip newspapers, and they liked to gossip about the famous writers. Uh, and uh, so this dispute got into the press, and Rousseau badmouthed Hume, uh, and Hume, uh, uh, you know, had the philosophes in Paris uh, who knew Rousseau very well jump into writing in the same tabloids, defending Hume and saying, "No, no, this is Rousseau's fault." Like, who cares? But it, again, it's a gossip sheet. Uh, but uh, uh, in the end, the public that read this overwhelmingly sided with Rousseau. Uh, why? Because they loved his books. Uh, they loved his writing. Uh, and, he, and he wrote uh, about human emotions and about uh, living a simple life and simplicity being better. Uh, and so people kind of thought, well, he can't be the bad guy in all this. He's the guy who wrote this uh, this uh, you know this this novel there was more than one uh, La Nouvelle Heloise for instance uh, that's sort of about uh, you know human emotion and uh, kind and considerate feelings and how living sort of a natural peaceful life back to nature or whatever is so wonderful and it is wonderful so he must be wonderful that uh, <laughs> uh, shows you how the public the public can often get things quite wrong uh, they got it totally wrong here. Uh, just because somebody writes something beautiful doesn't mean they're a beautiful soul, uh, but that's often kind of assumed to be true. Uh, so uh, if there was one common theme in Rousseau's writings, it stems actually from his first well-known piece of writing, uh, uh, the discourses or the discourse on uh, so the arts and sciences. He was actually an unknown writer. Uh, he was a musician too, and music teacher to make ends meet. But 
he uh, uh, answered uh, a call uh, to a, a an academy that had a contest, writing contest regularly. And uh, that year, 1751, I believe it was, the contest question, uh, essay question, was uh, how has the revival of the arts and sciences in Europe uh, been for the betterment uh, or the detriment of, of society? Which seems like a silly question, and I think it probably did to a lot of people at the time. I suppose, of course, the arts and sciences and their revival, uh, you know, sort of them getting better and better, have been a, a benefit to the society. How could that? How could it be otherwise? Uh, and uh, you probably won't be surprised, given what I've just said. Rousseau answered, uh, "No, it's been it's harmed uh, European study. Uh, science, uh, too much emphasis on science and the arts." Uh, and their advance has harmed uh, our civilization and society. And he's the only one uh, of all that, and there must have been many people that entered the contest that submitted an essay. He's the only one that answered in the negative, and he won the and he won the prize. So uh, maybe it was just because he was the only one that sort of dared be unique enough to uh, write, you know, on that side of the question. Uh, but it was probably because it was a brilliant essay as well as it was. Uh, uh, he said famously. Uh, man was born free, and everywhere he is in chains. Uh, famous statement. The uh, and uh, he claims in another later writing that when thinking about what he was going to write for the contest in 1751, uh, uh, how to answer that question, that he was walking in an orchard somewhere, uh, and he got like a flash of insight and started getting palpitations, started sweating, had to sit down, uh, and it, like came to him kind of like in this. Uh, and a sort of uh, eureka moment. Uh, I, I know the answer. Uh, the, 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 this is kind of the answer to many questions. Uh, and really becomes, I think, the central focus, uh, central idea of all of his writings. Uh, and that is that uh, man was uh, not just born free, but man was born good. Uh, human beings are by nature good, and it's only society and society's institutions that have corrupted him. So he, human beings uh, aren't sort of born sinfully, they're born good. Uh, but there's clearly lots of evidence of all kinds of people behaving badly and uh, corruptly and dishonestly, uh, cruelly, uh, but that's only because our institutions have been uh, so badly mangled and created uh, uh, that it's taken human beings away from their original good uh, nature. So it's not human beings that are bad, it's the institutions they've created that they've messed up. Uh, that's the theme, really, of all of his writings. Whether he's writing novels or philosophical treatises, the social contract was his contribution to political theory, what's the best type of government, uh, or, or uh, his uh, novel called Emile, which is about education and his thoughts on uh, how to improve uh, uh, the educational system of you know, kids. Uh, but all of them uh, really are based on that single idea uh, human beings are good uh, by nature. They're born good. Uh, and what screws it all up for everybody is our terrible, wicked society and, and social institutions ar around them. Uh, he was both progressive and sort of dangerous at the same time. Uh, he offered a trenchant critique of European society, brilliant in many ways, right on the money, I think, in many ways, but proposed solutions uh, that were sort of dangerous, I, I believe. Uh, as uh, one writer says on this, his genius, uh, like someone we'll meet later on, Friedrich Nietzsche's, uh, leaps off the page in flashes of insight, but becomes increasingly deeply compromised by personal fears, grudges, and paranoia, undercutting the verity, uh, uh, believability, and humanity of the remainder. So uh, the quote there is saying, uh, and this will be true, I think, of Nietzsche as well, when we get to him, that his writing in the end was marred by his own problems. Uh, and, and a lot of these guys had problems, but I think he might be the only one that had such severe kind of personality issues uh, and psychological issues uh, you know, and uh, emotional issues that it, it actually mars uh, his writing. Uh, and so there's too much of his own uh, issues sort of in, in his writings. I'm sure he didn't see it that way, but uh, I, I think it's a pretty fair assessment. But there's sort of a good Rousseau and then a bad Rousseau. So the good Rousseau uh, uh, includes uh, this statement. I forget where this comes from. Uh, These vain and futile declaimers, he means his fellow fellow his fellow philosophers, that's a tongue twister. These vain and futile declaimers go everywhere armed with their deadly paradoxes, 
undermining the foundations of faith and annihilating virtue. Uh, they smile disdainfully at the old-fashioned words of fatherland and religion and devote their talents and philosophy to destroying uh, and debasing all that is sacred among men. I think that comes from the 1751 essay that kind of put him on the intellectual map for the first time. He became famous uh, after that. As he wrote more and more. Uh, uh, Leon Cass, uh, current intellectual, uh, in a book not about Rousseau, but that has some very, I think, uh, keen observations about Rousseau, uh, a gifted kind of polymath scholar Cass is. He says that Rousseau argues that progress in the arts and sciences does not lead to greater virtue. Uh, it necessarily produces luxury, augments inequality, debases taste, softens character, corrupts morals, and weakens patriotism, leading ultimately not to emancipation, but to servitude, meaning slavery. Uh, could Rousseau be right? Cass asks. Is it really true that the natural home of intellectual progress is not the natural home of moral and civic virtue? Uh, as the arts and sciences climb upward, so morals, taste, and citizenship slide downward. Uh, and goes on to say, and one causes the other, so that the arts and sciences can only uh, flourish uh, at the expense of uh, sort of uh, morality and taste and, and commitment to citizenship, good citizenship. Uh, and Rousseau says yes. Uh, and uh, the, you know, the, the answer to these could be no, but I think Rousseau asks questions here, and Cass is kind of you know, repeating the questions, paraphrasing them uh, in a way that they're impossible to avoid, uh, honestly. Uh, so if you avoid them, you're, you're avoiding a, a, a serious uh, question that really needs to be answered. Whatever way it's answered, it needs to be uh, dealt with. That's, I think, the, the productive thought of Rousseau. Uh, uh, going back to uh, Bloom, uh, who wrote the, the, the book, uh, about Dolbach's Salon, which includes a great deal about Rousseau. He says, and this is bad Rousseau now, Rousseau's vision takes on a darker hue and eventually plunges into the blackness of totalitarian dictatorship. It needs to be controlled and policed, meaning the, the, the government, the society under the government. Uh, and Rousseau is aware of this. To ensure the morality of society, censorship is needed to guarantee that books and newspapers are constructive for public morality. Truth is not a matter of debate, not subject to learned argument, uh, but it relies on the insight of the individuals who are beyond being corrupted, for citizens are meaning the leaders, uh, kind of self-proclaimed you know, genius leaders, for the citizens are simply too ignorant to choose wisely. He had moved from a celebration of liberty in his career and writings and universal brotherhood to the murderous tyranny of virtue, a blueprint for every brutal dictator who ever soiled the face of the earth, meaning kind of in the future, French Revolution, Hitler, Stalin, the Soviet Union, uh, in the name of the general will, which he only claim, which only he claims to understand. Uh, uh, he is licensed to control, to censor, to lie, to punish, even to kill. So the dictator uh, decides what the general will is. General will is a, a famous phrase now, made famous by Rousseau, uh, but it's all often misleading. He didn't mean the majority by general will. He meant what the leader, dictator, uh, or maybe a handful of you know picked advisors to the dictator as well, what the dictator thinks is best for the country. Uh, that's the general will. Not not a poll or a vote of actual citizens. Okay, the majority think this. That's what we're going to do. That would be democracy. What he's saying, and this is, comes from his social contract, primarily book on political theory. You know, the general will is what people would want if they could understand what was good for them, but they're too stupid. Uh, only the wise dictator, uh, who becomes the dictator or the leader because he's so wise, and everybody sees that. Uh, follows him and say, yes, I guess he must be right. That is what we really want, even though I never thought I wanted it before. Uh, so uh, his uh, thinking, I, I do think, gets uh, out of control, as uh, Mr. Blom here uh, believes, and, uh, and not all scholars, but uh, many others uh, as well. But make no bones about it. R sorry, Rousseau uh, is one of the most influential, if not the most influential thinker of Enlightenment, for good and bad, uh, or both, and maybe more bad than good, but it's huge influence. We'll see, he had an influence on the French Revolution, for instance.
This brings us to yet another Frenchman. Remember, the Enlightenment is centered in France. Uh, Denis Diderot, the star of Dolbach's uh, Salon, uh, and the editor of uh, the greatest single intellectual project uh, of the Enlightenment, the Encyclopedia, uh, which was uh, came out in many, many volumes uh, over a period of uh, a number of years, over a couple decades. Uh, and Diderot was a talented writer and thinker in his own right, uh, but uh, and, and came to be sorry that he agreed to be the editor of this long-term project because it soaked up so much of his time. Uh, he wrote some of the entries in it, but he you know, edited it and put it all together and did all the organizational stuff, uh, along with a guy named D'Alembert. But D'Alembert eventually quit, uh, leaving Diderot having all the responsibility, and only because of his own, you know, commitment and you know. Uh, 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 dedication did he stick with it, but he hated he hated it, uh, and it did probably take him away from writing other thing, other brilliant things that he didn't have time for uh, because of this. Uh, what was the encyclopedia? It wasn't an encyclopedia in the sense we think of it. An encyclopedia today <coughs> collects knowledge, but there, it's just sort of thumbtail information, right? It's a reference. Which means if you, you know, don't know what an iguana is, you look it up in the encyclopedia and it gives you kind of the just basic paragraph. Okay, now I have at least a little bit of knowledge. But if you really wanted to become an expert in iguanas, uh, you're not going to read the encyclopedia to do it. You'd have to go way beyond that. This encyclopedia did sort of, you know, was alphabetized in many, many volumes. And it had essays on various subjects, uh, uh, you know, deism. And uh, uh, they, they were trying to collect all useful knowledge uh, uh, under the sun and put it in sort of one set of volumes. Uh, it ended up being like 15 volumes. I forget exactly. might have been changed from edition to edition. But, uh, of course, it's an impossible task to, to, to acquire all of the world's knowledge, though uh, uh, in their defense, in those days, it seemed possible or more possible since the stock of knowledge was far smaller than it is today. Uh, right now, there's been such an explosion of knowledge in every field uh, that it would be silly to even try to compile all the world's knowledge in every, uh, in you know, in, even in 15 volumes. Now it was maybe even silly then, but it was a little bit more understandable that they thought they could uh, do it, or at least uh, you know, the most important knowledge. So that was the goal. But the real difference, the biggest difference between this and Encyclopedia Britannica, whatever we think of it today, online or otherwise. Uh, is that these aren't just thumbnail sort of bits of reference information. Uh, th these are serious essays about this and that subject by the most gifted philosophs, Diderot included, Voltaire, Rousseau, uh, uh, most of the big names and the greatest talents, uh, intellects of the Enlightenment, uh, contributed one or more pieces, essays, uh, uh, alphabetized uh, to the encyclopedia. So, uh, right, that you don't do that in a... You don't have Einstein writing the you know, writing the I don't know the M uh, section letter M. Okay, let's get Einstein to do that. It's a waste of his uh, genius. Uh, you're writing thumbnail sketches about uh, you know uh, uh, mammoths. Uh, uh, that's a waste of his time. Okay, Einstein means you write a paragraph defining what a mammoth is. Uh, right? That isn't going to happen. So this is much more than a reference work. This is uh, this is serious intellectual fare. Uh, just to give you a, a sample. And the encyclopedia and the excerpts we have it here, from it here, and in our own books, uh, uh, show all the Enlightenment values that we talked about before and then some. Because it's a product over a couple of decades, right in the middle of the Enlightenment, so written by many of its greatest figures. So, uh, you know, surprise, surprise, Enlightenment values throughout. Uh, one article, I forget who wrote each one of these pieces. I'm just giving you a, a little taste of this uh, on peace. Uh, uh, one wrote, if reason governed men and had the influence over the heads of nations that it deserves, we would never see them inconsiderately surrender themselves to the fury of war. So uh, that was obviously uh, you know, sort of the Enlightenment's attempt to find uh, rational ways to avoid war. On political authority, it's not the state that belongs to the prince, it is the, I mean, the king, it is the prince who belongs to the state. Uh, but it does rest with the prince to govern in the state because the state has chosen him for that purpose. He has bound himself to the people and the administration of affairs, and they in their turn are bound to obey him according to the laws. So establishing in, in some ways the sort of social contract relationship that was 
uh, a sort of a well-known concept in political theory at the time. On the press, people ask if freedom of the press is advantageous or prejudicial to a state. It is of the greatest importance to conserve this practice in all states founded on liberty, freedom. Uh, this ought to be the common right of the universe, and it is certainly advisable to authorize its practice in all governments. So you couldn't get much more of a positive you know, affirmation of the importance of freedom of the press than this statement, but it's typically Enlightenment. Remember, the Enlightenment, uh, uh, the Enlightenment thinkers are the biggest champions of basic rights, freedom of the press, freedom of religion, freedom of property, uh, economic freedom, etc., etc., uh, and in France especially, they had to be, because uh, there wasn't freedom of the press. So they're trying to push for it uh, to make their you know, writing and getting published without being thrown in jail uh, uh, you know, uh, easier. And some of these guys did get thrown in jail, Voltaire uh, and some of the others, at least for a time. We now get to Adam Smith, uh, philosopher as economist, uh, a philosophy professor in Scotland who did write a book uh, 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 on... Uh, morality uh, and ethics, uh, which is something more typical that a philosophy professor would do, uh, but his most famous book you see on the right, The Wealth of Nations, uh, uh, is about economics, uh, although uh, he's a social thinker uh, uh, as well. Uh, he's the first person to really think about what became known as division of labor and seeing it as sort of one of the keys to a free market system and also uh, an industrial revolution under uh, uh, capitalism. Uh, he's the guy who coined the phrase the invisible hand, uh, uh, and he's promoting, uh, promoting free markets without really liking capitalists very much. The invisible hand, uh, by that he meant that uh, you don't actually, to get a, an economy to work effectively, uh, uh, you don't need or don't want to have an actual hand guiding it, which would be the government most likely, uh, you want uh, to allow market forces, free uh, 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 supply, demand, competition, etc., uh, uh, act sort of on its own. Let those things play out as social economic forces. Uh, and it's like an invisible hand is guiding it because there isn't really a guide. It kind of guides itself. So the invisible hand basically means the economy sort of works itself out. Uh, its fluctuations tend towards kind of equilibrium. Uh, and so it's better to leave it alone. Laissez-faire, the French word meaning hands off. Uh, he certainly was a, pr a supporter of, of, of that. Uh, as uh, one commentator says uh, about him, Smith sees the effect of division of labor on human personality uh, as something to be embraced, not lamented. Uh, commercial society is an intrinsic good because it is richly diverse because it expresses and enhances the beauty of human differentiation. Commercial society is admirable, Smith says, a flowering of the human spirit and not merely something plottingly peaceful and opulent. Uh, uh, so uh, to unpack that, uh, he's saying one of the things that makes capitalism beneficial uh, and sort of something to recommend is not just wealth production uh, it's that it makes society more diverse uh, it gives more there's more creativity because of sort of market competition uh, it sort of enhances uh, the idea or enhances it, it takes away sort of boring sameness uh, and sort of moves away at least in his view from uh, conformity uh, people have sort of a rich uh, uh, you know, set of uh, diverse ideas uh, for business and otherwise. And so it kind of, uh, it, even if the diversity is at first in business, it kind of filters down into society and the way uh, people in such societies think. Uh, they're used to thinking creatively, uh, finding market niches for a new business idea, whatever. Uh, and that uh, in turn sort of influences their thinking about culture uh, and everything else. I, I It's it's kind of vague, but I do think there's something to it, and there's other writers uh, later on in European history that sort of uh, take it uh, and sort of write uh, more about this. Uh, Smith had reservations uh, concerning the arrival and growth of commercial society, by which uh, the author here means, again, capitalism. His strongest reservation concerns the dehumanization of workers that accompanies division of labor. He said uh, in Wealth of Nations, about 300 pages in, the great body of people will become as stupid and as ignorant as is possible for a human creature to become if we allow division of labor 
to go uh, without government intervention. So he's actually, in a sense, contradicting himself. Uh, he's saying invisible hand most of the time. But if we involve the invisible hand, which means no regulation, the government just allows market conditions to go where they go. Uh, people get hired and fired or whatever, uh, uh, so be it, uh, that uh, we're going to have stupid and ignorant human beings, meaning the workers are going to be forced to work in this system uh, so many god-awful hours for so low wages, they'll be so exhausted that they'll never have time to do anything you know, intellectual, never go to the library, never read a book because they get off work and come home and go to eat and go to bed because they're exhausted, get up the next day and do the same thing. Uh, so he, he did, uh, uh, he's misunderstood a great deal. Uh, some people think because he was, you know, the great writer in favor of free markets and capitalism that he believed completely, uh, uh, in sort of, uh, you know, government, uh, uh, sort of laissez-faire, uh, hands-off policy. Uh, but he didn't, uh, he believed in some important but limited, uh, government interventions, uh, to maintain humanity. Uh, uh, so that the rough spots of capitalism that didn't lean in the direction of humanity would be kind of ironed out. Uh, so uh, the division of labor means kind of a number of different things. Uh, in a factory system, in a you know uh, industrial society, in a factory, kind of the assembly line concept, uh, jobs are divided up into smaller and smaller pieces uh, as the technology gets more sophisticated and production gets more effective. That's partly what makes it more effective. So you divide jobs into smaller and smaller pieces uh, on an assembly line, uh, and uh, you get much more productivity that way, which is true. Uh, uh, this was sort of one of the key concepts of the Industrial Revolution. And it was a little bit ahead of its time because it was right at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. Uh, so uh, the, well, how else would you do it? Well, the old-fashioned way, as we, I think, know by now, was uh, shopkeepers, uh, you know, artisans, craftsmen, shoemakers, uh, who made the entire pair of shoes and taught their apprentices and journeymen to make the entire pair of shoes uh, by hand uh, and all the steps. Uh, that's now uh, not being done as much. And those that still do it are under a competitive pressure because they can't compete with this because it's cheaper. Uh, because division of labor, dividing things into smaller tasks, uh, allows the product to be made much quicker. You can make more of them, uh, you know, in a 24-hour period or a week or a month. Uh, and uh, faster means cheaper. Cheaper means you can price it less and undersell your opponents and take all their customers. Uh, and this is one, you know, way we can think of division of labor. Another one is from society as a whole. Uh, uh, which uh, says then that each person specializes in sort of what they do. Uh, uh, they learn how to do you know, as a skill, as a job, as a profession, went to school for or taught by their father or their you know, uh, shoemaker master. Uh, and uh, uh, they then trade uh, or they make money from that and then pay uh, somebody else as a specialist in, uh, you know, I don't know, dentistry uh, to get their teeth pulled. So everybody specializes, uh, right? There's a division of labor, uh, right? That's true, of course, even now. Uh, at least theoretically, all you have to be good at is one thing uh, to be able to buy everything you need. Assuming you make enough money at your job, uh, right? You don't need to go out and uh, hunt. I mean, hunting is a sport, and people uh, you know, do it for uh, for sport, uh, for interests, uh, maybe to bring in a little extra food. Uh, but uh, you don't have to do that because there are other people that do that for you. You don't have to farm your own food. You don't have to make your own clothes. You can. Uh, but uh, the point is that division of labor includes uh, the way jobs and professions uh, and important tasks are divided up in a commercial uh, capitalist society. It's also uh, true there's a division, division of labor at the international level. Some countries specialize in certain products, uh, uh, well, maybe because they have the resources like oil, just by luck, uh, or uh, their land uh, and climate uh, is right for growing sugar or tobacco or whatever else it is. So some countries specialize and then trade with other countries instead of trying to make everything themselves. Uh, well, there have been countries that have tried the latter as well. Smith uh, was a brilliant social commentator as well as economic theorist. Uh, as uh, Samuel Gregg, I've already quoted in Reason, Faith, and the Struggle for Western Civilization, says, social scientists like Smith, studying the conditions in which human beings lived, proposed hypotheses 
uh, I didn't spell it right, hypotheses about how they might behave in different conditions. Uh, but their general objective was to identify paths toward freer and more just societies. So keep in mind from our sort of the outset here uh, and a couple of the segments ago that the Enlightenment project uh, was designed to uh, uh, look at institutions, uh, uh, evaluate them, and try to improve them. Uh, and Smith is giving us a great example of it and one of the most famous and biggest uh, he's looking at the entire economy of his home country of Great Britain, but he thought this could be applicable anywhere, uh, and uh, is saying, that, well, now we need to move away from mercantilism, uh, which includes uh, government-sanctioned monopolies, where the king just gives a monopoly on, say, coal mining uh, to one family, and no one else is even allowed by law to, to do coal mining. Uh, there's no competition in that. There's no market uh, forces involved in that. That's anti uh, a capitalist. So uh, Smith is saying that's just irrational. Uh, it's not good for, it might be good for that family, but it's really good for nobody else. Uh, so the, the this, uh, you know, is a practice that should be gotten away from. So he's a great example of the, the you know, pragmatic uh, reform-oriented nature of the Enlightenment uh, period, uh, Enlightenment uh, thought. Uh, this is his contribution to what he believed would make the economy uh, better and function uh, uh, more effectively. Uh, Smith, uh, as it says here, didn't particularly like capitalists. Uh, he didn't trust them. Uh, one, in one part of the book, I read it a long time ago, uh, he says another famous quote, and I'm paraphrasing it, but he said that two or more capitalists rarely get together in public without hatching a secret conspiracy against the public meaning they're always trying to you know, avoid market competition and capitalist principles, even though they're technically capitalists, uh, by rigging things in their favor. Uh, so they get together and sort of uh, collude on, on prices. Uh, instead of competing with each other and lowering the price on each other to get everybody's customers, why don't we just divide up the markets? You can have this part of town, I'll have that part of town, uh, and we'll, then we can set our prices higher because we're not competing with each other. Uh, good idea. Uh, right, uh, and so he's saying, uh, "I don't trust the capitalists. We have to uh, use this system or implement it in a way uh, that they can be held accountable." Or uh, he also said and believed, and I'm paraphrasing even more now, but he did basically say this: that unfortunately uh, for uh, uh, us, uh, uh, capitalism is the best system to uh, uh, you know to benefit everybody or m more people than any other way. Uh, but uh, he believed that what was beneficial about it was not that it was going to allow some to be millionaires and billionaires, or a few to be that. Uh, uh, that wouldn't be worth doing. Uh, uh, he thought it's worth it only because it'll help the majority of people do moderately better. Uh, so not become rich, but to do better than they would without a capitalist system. Uh, and so we do, so we do somewhat better. That's all he believed was was uh, necessary to fully endorse and fully promote free markets and free enterprise. Uh, that most people will do marginally or, or moderately better, uh, and as part of that, as a corollary to that, he said the ba the downside of that is that to make it work so that most of us can do moderately a bit better economically, make a little more money, make our lives a little more secure. Uh, we're going to have to allow these a-hole rich capitalists to make a lot more money. There'll be a few at the top that make a ton, uh, and the, but the, and that's that's lamentable because they're jerks most of the time. Uh, but don't tell them not to because they're kind of leading away the way, taking the risks for the rest of us who can kind of then grab their coattails and put up with their obnoxiousness, as he saw it anyway, uh, uh, to make our own economic lives moderately better. So he wasn't promoting capitalism, another misunderstanding commonly attributed to him uh, because he liked the idea of greed and you know wanted this to be this race uh, to see who can sort of become the wealthiest. Uh, but he thought we just have to put up with these guys uh, if we want to, uh, the big, the more important goal of making the rest of us moderately better off. Immanuel Kant, uh, the little German philosophy professor who almost never left his uh, little hometown in Germany, I never traveled, uh, little guy with a big brain. Uh, he was uh, incredibly punctual. Uh, 
uh, meaning uh, he was on time for everything and did everything at the same time in a routine that he rarely broke. His neighbors knew it was like three o'clock in the afternoon without looking at a clock because they saw, you know, Kant walking by their, you know, their front uh, uh, yard uh, on the sidewalk walking his dog. Oh, it must be three o'clock. There's Kant with his dog because he comes out at three every friggin' day. Uh, so a very meticulous individual in his personal life. But one of the most gifted uh, thinkers, uh, not just in the Enlightenment, but in all of the history of Western philosophy. But he did write a essay in 1784 called What is Enlightenment? Uh, interestingly enough. Uh, and uh, uh, he didn't uh, necessarily think of himself as an Enlightenment thinker, though we lump him in there, uh, I think, correctly today. And he wasn't maybe in every way, uh, but in many ways, he sort of fits the bill almost perfectly. Uh, famously, in that essay, uh, he says, Dare to know. Have the courage to use your own intelligence or your own reason. That's the motto of the Enlightenment. Uh, so uh, he's sort of making this, in some ways, this is a, a pay-on to the importance of critical thinking, uh, thinking for yourself, using reason uh, and using it wisely and using it uh, to you know, make society and your own life better. Uh, uh, so uh, he also uh, believed that the public uh, use of reason must always be free uh, and it alone, it alone can bring enlightenment among men. So we have to have freedom of speech, freedom of inquiry, uh, intellectual freedom uh, in any decent society. Uh, so uh, he was uh, against war and thought that uh, they they're, tried to uh, lay out a sort of rational, uh, philosophical uh, uh, way of sort of avoiding war. Uh, uh, an enormously productive uh, and fertile uh, thinker of the Enlightenment. Another German, uh, Gotthold Ephraim Lessing, uh, uh, wrote, among other things, a famous play called Nathan the Wise. Uh, and the main character of Nathan the Wise was based on uh, uh, a, it was a, you know, a fictional character, but based on the life of one of his good friends, the Jewish scholar and Enlightenment thinker in his own right, Moses Mendelssohn. Uh, and uh, one of the things that comes across in Lessing's work is that he's, uh, uh, he emphasizes man, it says here from the quote, in particular, and man in general. And he believed that uh, it was more important to focus on man in general uh, than in the particular. We've already noted that that's an, a, 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 a main enlightenment idea and concept. Uh, he actually said to focus on man in, the, in particular was only to know fools and scoundrels. But the study of man in general, where he exhibits greatness uh, and uh, his uh, divine origin, uh, uh, consider what enterprise man accomplishes, how he daily extends the limits of his understanding, what wisdom prevails in his laws, what ambition inspires his monuments. Uh, he wants to know about human beings as a species uh, and not as individuals. He's kind of saying, if you take any human being uh, in the moment, they're idiots, all of us. Uh, but if you look at human beings over long periods of time uh, and what they can accomplish in kind of an evolutionary way, it's extraordinary. Uh, uh, so you can see human brilliance and, and you know, thought power, uh, reason being used extremely well only over the long haul. And that's how we should study it. Uh, we should study sort of the general characteristics of human nature uh, and not what makes each one of us tick because all we'll find is fools and scoundrels. Uh, an interesting way to think of it. Cesare Beccaria, a Russian. No. That's an Italian name. If you ever heard of Cesare Beccaria uh, on crimes and punishments. In some ways, he was kind of a one-hit wonder. Uh, this uh, was you know, the book that put him on the map and kind of kept him on the map. Uh, and he had quite a modern conception of crimes and punishments. This book was on you know, criminal justice. Uh, and uh, he was against torture, which was a common judicial practice at the time. Uh, he didn't believe in the death penalty, uh, which was unheard of, uh, except among some philosophers at the time, because the death penalty uh, uh, was had been around for forever, and most people totally accepted it. Uh, but all of his thinking and reasoning in this uh, book that became famous, so famous that he got invited to Dolbach's salon when he was in Paris, and did go uh, once or twice, uh, and was kind of the star uh, of that limited time. Everybody was fascinated by what he'd written, and most were in general agreement. Uh, but uh, he went about his business in sort of analyzing 
the uh, uh, judicial systems of Europe uh, uh, in a very enlightenment-oriented way, collecting evidence, uh, using scientific method, uh, reason, logic, uh, analyzing then the institutions, uh, right? In the, another example of the philosophs focus on institutions, in this case, uh, you know, criminal justice systems in one country after another, or kind of general recommendations that he, that he made. The Marquis de Condorcet, another noble aristocrat Frenchman, uh, uh, this guy really believed uh, strongly in the Enlightenment project, really believed in progress to the point of believing that human beings could perfect themselves and perfect society. Yeah, uh, uh, so uh, uh, he was a brilliant mathematician and a brilliant guy, uh, but he got kind of carried away uh, with what uh, human beings can do. And he was a top-notch Enlightenment figure, uh, no doubt about it, uh, but part of the reason I include him, uh, because he's a good example uh, of uh, one of the critiques or criticisms of the Enlightenment today, and that is human beings getting kind of too full of themselves and thinking they can do more than they actually can, can accomplish more than they're actually capable of. Uh, so uh, he uh, was sort of maybe, he wasn't the only one, uh, but uh, uh, he was in the minority of thinking that uh, human thought, human reason could sort of perfect uh, human beings and human society. Uh, he didn't have much knowledge of history, uh, although he wrote an overview of all human history, uh, which was sort of very general and vague and not very persuasive, uh, but it was extremely optimistic uh, about uh, uh, the potential for progress. Mary Wollstonecraft, uh, one of the uh, later kind of younger generation Enlightenment thinkers uh, uh, of extreme importance uh, in, in uh, with one book, especially uh, Vindication of the Rights of the Rights of Woman in 1792, uh, so towards the end of the century. Uh, and uh, uh, as Professor Rourke, our textbook author, says, one of the founders of modern feminism and a deeply committed defender of liberty, human rights, and the French Revolution. A vindication, meaning the book, is a classic statement on women's rights and the causes of prejudice and inequality. Uh, Anthony Kenny, in his book on the Enlightenment, says uh, that she argued that virtue was neutral between the sexes and considered in the development of natural faculties common to both men and women, or consisted in. Uh, the conventional allocation of different roles to the different sexes was as artificial, in her opinion, as corrupt and corrupt as the conventional distinctions of rank and power. Political structures should be reformed to take account of this novel conception of private virtue. This was a blockbuster piece of writing. Uh, it was by far uh, sort of out in front of everything else in terms of uh, women's rights. Uh, and in many ways, you know, uh, it sort of, uh, uh, you know, appears that it would likely have been written much later than this. So she was a revolutionary figure uh, in sort of the origins uh, of uh, women's rights writing uh, and thinking. Uh, so uh, uh, an important uh, contributor, uh, uh, because of course th these issues are still very much with us uh, uh, right now. But she's one of the founders, really, of uh, you know, women's rights thought. Uh, not so much of activism, that comes a little bit later, uh, but certainly uh, uh, sort of uh, thinking uh, on women's issues. Jeremy Bentham, uh, another peach of a, of a guy. Uh, these guys, uh, Bentham, uh, especially uh, uh, Condorcet, Rousseau, some of them are really characters. Uh, not always in a good way, as we've seen. Uh, uh, Bentham, uh, maybe the best story about Bentham is that uh, he had an association with the University of London, and on his death, he had it in front of his will, and they've honored this. You can find pictures of it, uh, photographs on the uh, internet. Uh, uh, Google this if you don't believe me. Uh, Jeremy Bentham, uh, in his will, said he wanted to be uh, preserved and stuffed uh, like embalmed, uh, and sort of kept on display at the University of London. Uh, and uh, I, I think it's a wax head that they put on, uh, but uh, he's clothed and has a cane and a tie on and everything, and sometimes they'll wheel him out in this chair. It's a dead guy. Dead bo it's a dead body uh, that they still have, and they will actually bring it out every once in a I don't know if they still have it. Maybe they finally dispense with it. It's been a number of years since I uh, had heard anything about it. 
but I, I wouldn't be surprised if it's still there. Uh, but he was an eccentric guy that kind of shows it uh, in many other ways too, but another gifted uh, thinker. Uh, and uh, was kind of a child prodigy, uh, mathematician, uh, but uh, he had sort of radical views, uh, an, an Englishman again. Uh, he's famous for uh, being hired to uh, look at the prison system in England uh, and offer ideas uh, for reform and wrote about it. Uh, and uh, s some of his uh, reform uh, proposals did get uh, put into practice by the government. Uh, as Samuel Gregg, we've quoted before, said, Bentham's radicalness lay in his conviction that everything, customs, institutions, laws, should be addressed on a scientific basis, by which he meant objective tests of their utility, usefulness, understood as, in his mind, the maximizing of pleasure and the minimizing of pain. The purpose was to quantify human moral choices. Uh, so, uh, this is the idea of kind of science and math uh, as applied to improving society, making progress, uh, gone almost haywire. Uh, so uh, I put this on here again partly because it's an example of another, another one of the criticisms of the Enlightenment, uh, which we saw, uh, which is uh, that this, uh, uh, you know, it becomes sort of science and quantification and math is everything, and there's no other way to understand humanity uh, and, and the world. Uh, Bentham is an ex takes this to an extreme. Uh, you can see in the middle, this is of course a modern poster, but he actually developed what he called a philosophic calculus. Felicity means happiness. Uh, he believed that happiness was based on maximizing pleasure, as it says, minimizing pain, literally. Uh, and so he had a way to measure it, and he thought he did. Uh, and he actually, okay, so uh, if we're going to measure whether something is going to bring more pain or pleasure than pain, we have to look at the duration of the, uh, and whether it's worth doing. Uh, whether, okay, this is going to bring me uh, pleasure, but uh, uh, is it worth doing? Well, it depends on how long it lasts, its intensity, uh, its extent, its certainty, its purity, its what? And he had this whole sort of chart that you could then sort of use uh, for this or that pleasure or pain, uh, and whether it's worth going through that pain to get this result or going, you know, to experiencing that pleasure. Is there enough of it to last long enough? Uh, uh, <laughs> it's quantification, again, uh, uh, gone mad. Uh, not that he was mad. Uh, again, he was a serious uh, thinker and, and, and also uh, you know, a very uh, a talented one. Uh, but uh, I think this is still in many ways an example uh, of sort of an overemphasis on uh, everything having to be scientific. If you're actually ca if you're actually taking pleasure and pain, uh, right, and happiness and boiling it down to uh, uh, you know, sort of uh, numbers and statistics, uh, uh, that's saying something. Uh, also, he's the father of the uh, school of uh, philosophy or thought, uh, mainly specific to Great Britain, where he was from, of utilitarianism. Uh, and his best friend, James Mill, uh, was a talented thinker and writer, also utilitarian. And James Mill's son, who's more famous than both of them, John Stuart Mill, uh, also a utilitarian thinker to some degree, uh, but becomes one of the greatest thinkers of the 19th century, uh, who we'll get to uh, later as well. Uh, Bentham even had a hand in uh, educating Mill's son, John Stuart, uh, the, the more famous of all of them. Lastly, uh, the Enlightenment and social justice. Since I started uh, uh, with uh, sort of some of the things that the Enlightenment is criticized for, uh, this is the one that it gets criticized the most for presently. Uh, Professor Perry uh, says, modern critics condemn the Enlightenment for being inconsistent, but imagine the alternative. Absolute monarchs and monarchies, because they were against that. Uh, uh, they wanted power to be spread out more and uh, more, uh, you know, uh, some say by the people, if not total democracy. Established churches, which meant churches that you don't have an option. Uh, uh, it's the state uh, church and you better be a Catholic or you know, whatever or leave. Uh, state run torture chambers, uh, where torture was you know, considered a good thing, a totally legal and above board thing. Censorship of speech and writing, so no basic freedoms, and uh, maybe he could he could have added uh, no uh, freedom uh, of property or right to uh, 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 private property, uh, etc. So uh, it's, a, it's a good point. 
uh, that there's plenty the Enlightenment can be criticized for, uh, but uh, these things that it established, if it hadn't established them uh, or changed them, uh, we might still have all these problems or horrors uh, even now. Uh, but let's look at some of the ones uh, that we can uh, help us to make kind of a judgment on this, uh, at least give us uh, some background. Uh, the Enlightenment uh, uh, thinking on slavery. Uh, this comes from Perry as well, our author of our text. On the problem of slavery, some uh, philosophers were strangely ambivalent. Uh, uh, in an ideal world, just about all agreed slavery would not exist, however. But the world was not ideal. Uh, so uh, many of them were basically saying we're going to have to put up with slavery uh, even though we don't like it, uh, which still comes across uh, right to, uh, you know, as rather uh, you know, uh, not good enough to us today. By the second half of the century, though, a new generation of philosophers launched bitter attacks on slavery. With Rousseau in the vanguard or lead, they condemned slavery as a violation of the natural rights of man. Remember the... Enlightenment basically believes in the idea of natural rights, natural law. Uh, and so Rousseau and others argued that it was a violation of the nat natural rights. Human beings were born to exercise reason and their own willpower, since they have reason and willpower. Uh, so then they weren't born to be enslaved so that they couldn't use their reason with how they wanted to, when they wanted to, and couldn't use their willpower to go and do whatever they want, whenever they want to. So uh, it was a clear violation to... Uh, at least many of the philosophers were so you know, upfront, uh, uh, violation of natural rights. The philosophers invented the concept of human rights. Uh, so uh, right, that's a major concept in our world today. Uh, it was basically invented by these guys. So uh, uh, can they be criticized for not condemning slavery enough? Yes, overall, and some of them certainly. Uh, but does the Enlightenment sort of deserve to be completely, uh, you know, sort of, eliminated uh, as something positive because of that it's hard because you're, you're talking about uh, uh, you know having not only being against slavery but having sort of intellectual backing for it it violates the rights of man so they had an actual uh, sophisticated argument against slavery uh, and also the concept of human rights uh, which sort of human means it sort of applies to everybody everybody's got the same rights worldwide uh, how about uh, other uh, groups? Uh, uh, right, uh, with slavery, we're talking mostly about uh, Africans and African Americans uh, at the time. The Jews, uh, uh, Locke, uh, as uh, uh, one uh, book on the Enlightenment that I haven't quoted yet, I think, uh, put the matter succinctly. Uh, Locke uh, on toleration, or his letter on toleration, when he wrote that quote, neither pagan nor Mohammedan, meaning. Uh, Muslim, nor Jew, ought to be excluded from the civil rights or commonwealth because of his religion. Such is the Enlightenment response to anti-Semitism, hatred of Jews, and its logic uh, holds for other groups. Montesquieu stood in the forefront of the battle against anti-Semitism in France, while Lessing, uh, who we did talk about as well, uh, and Wilhelm Dom, Dom who we didn't, uh, pled the case for the Jews in Germany. Uh, how about the Enlightenment and common humanity? Uh, again, sort of uh, human rights oriented. If I knew something useful to me and harmful to my family, says Montesquieu, I would reject it from my mind. If I knew something to be useful to my family and not to my country, I would try to forget it. If I knew something useful to my country and harmful to Europe, or useful to Europe and harmful to mankind, I would look upon it as a crime. Uh, so he's basically saying that the ultimate uh, uh, responsibility uh, is to mankind. Uh, sort of the, the broadest sort of way we the the, the broadest we can sort of uh, sort of expand the moral circle cultural differences uh, the enlightenment and cultural differences in eurocentrism uh, which means uh, Europeans sort of seeing themselves as the center of uh, you know, everything the end all and be all of humanity uh, this uh, coming from Diderot uh, one of the you know most gifted here uh, the Tahitian is your brother uh, meaning people from Tahiti you are both children of... Oh, he's he's putting words into the mouth of a Tahitian leader. So this is coming from the point of view, uh, uh, at least as he uh, thinks it, it would, from a Tahitian. He says, you are both children... And he's talking to Europeans. You are both children of nature. Uh, what right do you have over him that he does not have over you? When you came, meaning to us, to Tahiti, did we set upon you? I mean, did we try to harm you? No. Did we pillage your vessel? 
No. Did we make you uh, our captive and leave you to the arrows of our enemies? No. Did we yoke you to our plows and put you to work in the fields like animals? No. We treated you in our own image. We treated like you, we treat each other in our own society. Let us alone with your ways. Uh, let us alone with our ways. Uh, they are wiser and more honest than yours. We have no desire to trade what you call our ignorance for your useless enlightenment. So Diderot has the capacity to put himself in the shoes of another cultural and ethnic and racial group uh, and see it from their perspective and see it favorably from their perspective. Now, maybe he didn't think that way all the time. Maybe this was an experiment, you know, that he was able to do for a short time and snap back into more prejudicial thinking, which is actually probably likely. But the fact that he wrote this at all and was able to see it from this perspective at all in the 18th century is to me what's most striking about it. 